Thank you. Bonjour tout le monde. Good morning. Quai Bokertov. Messieurs les présidents euh, Prémont et Bacon, Monsieur l'ambassadeur Hoffman, autres dignitaires et invités de marque, j'ai l'immense plaisir de vous accueillir aujourd'hui à notre table ronde intitulée « Combattre l'antisémitisme au Canada, jurisprudence pertinente et meilleure pratique pour nos campus et nos communautés ». President Fremont and Bacon, uh, Ambassador Hoffman, other dignitaries and distinguished guests, to welcome you all here today to our panel discussion entitled Confronting Antisemitism in Canada, Relevant Jurisprudence and Best Practices for our campuses and our communities. Uh, before we get started today, I uh, wish to pray, we wish to pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of the land upon which we are now situated. We acknowledge the Algonquin people's long-standing relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We also pay respect to all Indigenous peoples across the world. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leadership, past, present, and future. My name is Kerry Kogan. I'm a full professor of clinical psychology here at the University of Ottawa. Since being hired in 2005, I have generally felt welcome and free to express myself fully on this dynamic campus. Unfortunately, over the last few years, I've witnessed a concerning rise in incidents targeting Jewish people and core aspects of our Jewish identity. Similar events have been reported across Canadian campuses, tracking the precipitous rise in anti-Semitic discourse across all sectors of Canadian society. Within the academy, statements and baseless one-sided rhetoric are regularly issued about Israel that do not seek to advance the pursuit of knowledge or truth, but rather are intended to delegitimize and vilify her. Expression, uh, expressions of opposing views to these statements are routinely quashed. These concerted efforts do nothing to advance peace in the Middle East, but rather deny Jewish people their right to self-determination and foment hatred of Jews with real-world consequences. These statements and actions also imperil, imperil viewpoint diversity, academic freedom, and freedom of uh, expression. At times, they veer into hate speech. To put it bluntly, Jewish identity is under attack. Data from Statistics Canada reveal that Jewish people are victims to the highest per capita number of hate crimes, and this has been increasing each year over the last seven years. I'm concerned about these new threats to the values and principles of the academy and to Jewish identity. Part of my research program here at the University of Ottawa <clears throat> has focused on understanding the impact of anti-Black racism on mental health of Black Canadians. The data we collected are stark and shocking. For example, Black Canadian youth who report experiencing the most frequent incidents of racism have rates of depression that are 36 times higher than those reporting the least frequent incidents. My guess is that anti-Semitism has a similarly pernicious effect. Seeing the detrimental impact of racism on Black Canadians combined with the observation of increasing hostility and discrimination towards Jewish people has motivated me to act. Today's panel discussion is part of a larger convening we're holding this weekend titled Combating Antisemitism on Canadian Campuses, a convening to engage, educate, and empower faculty, for which I am co-chair with Professor Deidre Butler from Carleton. We are joined by colleagues from other Canadian universities serving as steering committee members. We're gathering this weekend as a group of concerned academics to listen to and learn from uh, Miriam Elman and her leadership team at the Academic Engagement Network, which is a US-based non-for-profit organization promote, promoting academic freedom and freedom of expression, combating anti-Semitism, countering delegitimization of Israel on campuses, and working to promote rigorous scholarship on Israel and Jewish identity. We're fortunate that there are excellent Jewish organizations uh, that support and defend Jewish students on campuses in contrast, there is no organization in Canada with a successful model for academics that supports, educates, and empowers Canadian faculty on campuses in the way that the Academic Engagement Network does in the U.S. We look forward to our exchanges with the AN leadership to determine how to build a faculty network in the Canadian context. I wish to express my deep gratitude to President Fremont for his ongoing support and engagement in the process of examining our campus climate for Jewish students faculty and staff. I'm delighted that he has agreed to lend his expertise to the panel for our discussion today. I applaud his steadfast opposition to boycott motions of Israel that have been proposed here at the university, as well as his engagement over the last two years in finding ways to protect Jewish students, faculty, and staff. 
I also thank Miriam Elman, Executive Director of the Ac Academic Engagement Network, for being here today to moderate this panel, as well as to her and her team for providing our steering committee with important insights on how to build an engaged and empowered network of academics from across all disciplines uh, to promote academic freedom, balance scholarship on Israel and Jewish identity, and support academics across all disciplines in combating intolerance and discrimination uh, against Jewish people. I'm grateful to my colleagues in the audience on the steering committee for their support and guidance as we embark on building a nonpartisan organization based on principles of fairness, academic freedom, and respect for minorities. Last but certainly not least, we wish to express our deep gratitude to the Azraeli Foundation for their generous support for today's panel discussion and the events taking place this weekend, including our meetings to discuss establishing a faculty network in Canada. <clears throat> Je laisse maintenant la, la parole uh, à mon, uh, ma co-présidente, Dr. Deirdre Butler de l'Université Carleton. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Professor. Merci, Dr. Kogan. Um, I just, before I even begin, I just wanted to explain to you the brochures that are sitting on your chairs. It's not a way of saying you can't come, but today is our only public event. But we wanted to share them with you just to show you how excited we are to do the things that we're doing this weekend in convening our steering committee and having conversations with uh, local administration and EDI folks about issues having to do with anti-Semitism. And I, I personally, as a professor at Carleton, I just want to thank so much my own president, um, President Bacon, who is here today, and other representatives of Carleton. Uh, we're here on Ottawa U turf, but um, we're very welcome and we're all doing the good fight together. So this is um, a pleasure to be here. So my name is Deidre Butler and I'm an associate professor of religion at Carleton. And as a specialist in Jewish studies, my teaching and research focuses on Jewish life and practice in the modern world with specializations in gender and sexuality and the Holocaust. I am also the director of the Max and Tessie Zelikovitz Center for Jewish Studies, which brings together scholars, students, and the public to support research and create programming in Jewish studies in historical, contemporary, and global perspectives. And while anti-Semitism was not initially my academic focus or the focus of the Center for Jewish Studies, it has become one out of necessity. We find ourselves now addressing anti-Semitism in all aspects of our work. It has become a necessity because the terrain has shifted. We see a rise of anti-Semitic incidents around the world and across campuses at the very moment when, as a society and across our campuses, we're becoming more aware of issues of inclusion and diversity. Despite this growing understanding of the ways in, much in which we must work for more inclusive spaces, we are hearing alarming reports from students, staff, and faculty about the myriad ways in which Jews feel unsafe as Jews on our campuses. For the last two years, I've convened a meeting of chairs and directors of Jewish studies from programs across Canada, and I have frankly been shocked by the cumulative and escalating examples of Jew hatred that Jewish faculty and students face across our nation. What is happening? Why are our campuses, in particular, a fertile ground for Jew hatred in 2022? My students are increasingly sensitive to issues of race, but are confounded by anti Semitism. They know very little about the Holocaust or of historical tropes that have marked the history of anti Semitism. They simply lack the historical knowledge and tools to untangle the problem of Jew hatred, which overflows the familiar categories of race or religious bigotry. At the same time, students are learning about these issues from anti-Israel activists who deploy these categories in a shell game, such that students without familiarity with the historical forms of anti-Semitism cannot recognize when legitimate criticism of a state slips into anti-Semitic trope and incitement to hate. Jewish perspectives on Israel are unknown to them, and they are often startled to learn of the layered and complex ways Israel continues to be central to Jewish life, 
culture, religion, and identity. We see that the terrain has shifted in the countless ways Holocaust history and anti-Semitism scholarship and teaching are politicized and even criminalized around the world. Here at the University of Ottawa, Professor Jan Grabowski, who's with us today, has faced criminal and civil charges that are aimed at silencing his research on Polish responsibility during the Holocaust. When Israel is delegitimized de de on our campuses, our campuses are not safe spaces for students, staff, or faculty. This coming May, I will travel with 22 students to Israel, where we will study religion in the region. Most of my students are not Jewish and choose this course because they want to explore this place for themselves and learn why this place is so important to so many people. This course, which is very successful and which brings students into conversation with local scholars and students from diverse religious and ethnic backgrounds, is nevertheless one that has aroused some of the most sustained anti-Semitic attacks of my professional career. In convening today's panel, our goal is to listen to those experts in the law to offer us guidance and strategies for negotiating the intersecting challenges that anti-Semitism poses on Canadian campuses. The purpose of our meeting today is not simply to acknowledge the presence of anti-Semitism, but move to solutions. For those of us on campus, there are two key elements of this conversation. First, what is anti-Semitism and what are the tools and strategies that have proven to be effective? Second, how do we uphold the principles of academic freedom and freedom of speech? In short, how do we address anti-Semitism, ensure that our campuses are safe spaces for all, and promote rigorous scholarship and robust debate? We come together today in the shared understanding that we need a strategic response to anti-Semitism on Canadian campuses. Why do campuses matter? They matter because what is at stake is the future of our society. Universities are where young people learn facts and gain knowledge. But more importantly, our campuses are where they develop critical thinking skills about the world we live in. In these formative years, where students develop their understanding of social justice, of civil debate, and reasoned analysis, what are the professional leaders of tomorrow? Our future lawyers, doctors, social workers, educators, and business people learning about anti-Semitism. Who are they learning from? How do we educate and empower students to recognize Jew hatred and stand against it? At this moment, I'd like to share a short video that brings together the video voices of Canadian Jewish students who share their experiences of anti-Semitism on their own campuses. So uh, with Scarborough, it's a very small campus in terms of Jewish population. So it, it can be very isolating when anti-Semitism does happen. U of T undergraduate student union organized a virtual clubs fair for all recognized student groups to attend. I submitted an application for students supporting Israel at U of T as we are a recognized student group um, to attend the clubs fair. Our application was accepted. We were listed on the official bulletin, which was released by the student union. But shortly after the bulletin was released, a handful of very large and influential student groups uh, organized a boycott of the club's fair because of our attendance. And they said that they were organizing this because a Zionist propaganda club was in attendance. Uh, within hours, I received an email from an executive member of the student union telling me we weren't allowed to be part of the club's fair. And she was citing clerical reasons. These reasons were that we didn't have the proper recognition we needed to participate in the club's fair. I found this really hard to believe considering we were accepted in the first place and we were listed on the official bulletin in the first place. The most pertinent example is with the recent motions that have been passed um, that basically state every executive member of our student union needs to support BDS and that our student union will no longer support Jewish student clubs, such as our club, Jewish Student Life or Hillel, both apolitical groups.
from students. It's generally surrounding misconceptions over the actions of the Israeli government, the legitimacy of the Israeli state, um, and my relation and complicity to any alleged actions. Uh, this ultimately culminated in the push for BDS on campus, which was ultimately rephrased and passed through our student union in a way that targeted Zionist speech on campus, um, which is intentionally vague and could be left open for interpretation in a very anti-Semitic way. And we're at a stage where this BDS committee exists. Now to clarify for everyone, the BDS committee is something that as a grad student, I have to pay money towards. It exists within our union. It can send emails to all grad students to let them know about their events. Some of their events have included inviting a former Palestinian, uh, uh, an individual who was ties to a Palestinian terrorist organization. Uh, they have had an event about the academic boycott of Israel. These are not just events about trying to stop, to, to advocate for sanctions against companies. And, and it's very hard as a graduate student to deal with this. During Tu B'Shvat, we had put up posters about an event that we were trying to promote. And the Students in Justice in Palestine decided to put up posters saying that this event uh, supports Israeli colonialism with regards to environmental policy, a whole lot of nonsense. And we decided to go to the student union to say, this is wrong, we need action, we need you to do something. And so they said that they would hold a meeting with that, with that group, uh, Jewish Student Life at, UT, at Scarborough. We were never invited to this meeting. And until this day, this happened years ago, I have no idea if this meeting even took place. Right. They claim they did, I don't know. And so when I messaged back and asked what, what happened, they said it was dealt with, and that was it. It was a Jewish holiday. It may have had Israel in the title of the poster, but it was a Jewish holiday. And they decided to put a poster saying that this was supporting Israeli apartheid. Unfortunately, we also have had individual members, such as our um, president of our student union, who have commented on the fact that Judaism is just a religion and that Zionism does not play a part in that, um, which when, when Zionism for a lot of Jewish people is an integral part of our identity. A chat of like 20 other um, Jewish students from Calgary uh, talking about how they were scared to go back to campus. Um, online, it was really difficult because a lot of um, Instagram, social media pages of clubs on campus were sort of aligning um, against Israel and posting a lot of really problematic things, which was really scary, um, especially sort of big clubs that have a lot of influence. Um, and the, com the comment section was what was really scary, you know, seeing your friends comment things, post things um, was scary. And at one meeting, a non-Jewish student looked at us and said, anti-Semitism is just feelings of discomfort. You don't know what this is like. For months, I could not work with many of my non-Jewish peers in student government because they didn't want to work with a dirty Zionist. An anonymous student published an article on medium.com alleging that Jewish students had a blacklist circulating of anti-Israel peers that had been passed down between Jewish student leaders for decades. Copying the tactics we'd seen from a similar incident in 1903 when the Russian government fabricated the infamous Protocols of the Elders of Zion, we had no way to refute this claim because there was no blacklist. This yet again, through the politically engaged student body, through the politically engaged student body against each other in all levels of government, going as far as to publicly name Jewish and non-Jewish students who had previously supported the idea of the State of Israel. And um, a man came up to us while we were tabling who I do not believe to be a member of the campus community and very aggressively asked us uh, if we Jews could stand by our values and explain to him the actions of the Israeli government. Uh, he then proceeded to make the bold, bold claim that uh, we Jews and Israel were responsible for the death of thousands of Palestinians a day. 
Uh, he then followed that up by saying, I know I'm exaggerating, but I need to make a point about you people. Uh, I was told by a person I knew, he graduated, that um, during the official boycott sanction divest motion that they were trying to pass at Scarborough, he had decided to wear his keeper, I guess, to show he was not as he wasn't he wasn't scared. And he was in a Tim Hortons line at within the campus and someone was behind him and said, You dirty Jew. And he turned around and he was said, Who who do you think you're talking to? And he said, You you are a dirty Jew, threw nickels on the on the floor and said, Pick it up, Jew. I made some friends in my first year that had never met Jews before. And one of them asked, like, where are your horns? I knew it came from ignorance, but it felt so uncomfortable and unwelcoming to hear such a classic anti-Semitic trope straight to my face. I've also had people say jokes about like Jews chasing after money in front of me, knowing that I'm Jewish. I think that a lot of it goes unnoticed because people don't want to speak up about it, but it definitely occurs. I personally have sat through lectures where Israel was brought up despite there being no connection to the topic at hand. I would avoid taking classes that I was academically interested in because the professor was known to bring up anti-Semitic points. I was forced to decide between my values and the unique opportunity to learn from well-established professors at a venerated institution because who was I to disagree with these professors? From professors, I have had um, one in particular who uh, assigned us a book that was not only anti-Semitic in nature and very negatively descriptive of exclusively Jewish controlled banks and the Rosenthal's and George Soros, but the author was a Holocaust denier. Um, and the professor himself was very obsessed with the idea of a global elite that was controlling the world uh, through globalization. I had another professor who had assigned us something that greatly diminished the effects and uh, the meaning of the Holocaust, saying it was solely religious discrimination and negated the, the racial component of Nazi race laws and, and completely diminished uh, their importance. He also would assign us readings that, um, com they, you know, compared the treatment of Palestinians in in the Levant to that of Jews in the Shoah, which is incomparable. You cannot compare any sort of wrongdoing or crime or atrocity. None of these are the same thing or they can be equated to each other. I agree what I heard a graduate student once say that there is a litmus test and every group you go into, you have to try and demonstrate that you're the good type of Jew that, you know, are on the right side of the Israeli conflict. When I first came home in the summer from school, everyone asked me what sort of anti-Semitism was going on at the moment, and I thought they were ridiculous because I'd just finished my first year and hadn't seen too much. Little did I know, every single time I would come home for a break, there would be something to discuss. Late nights were had in the middle of the midterms, student meetings had to be prioritized over a social life, but what choice did I have? If I wasn't going to stand up for my community, who would? These are the students who motivate us. Their voices call us to action. To our members of the community who've taken their valuable weekend time to be with us today, we want to emphasize our commitment to protecting the fundamental values of the academy, which includes the protection of academic freedom, a right that is not only only afforded to faculty, but to all members of the campus community. As scholars, we respond to these challenges with a commitment to the highest standards of the academy. We will not silence those whose views we oppose, and we will not be silenced. We will respond with scholarly evidence, reason, and humanity. We hope that the conversation that begins here and the strategies and tools that we identify will be carried back to each of our own settings on our own campuses, in our own classrooms, and in our broader community.
Nous espérons que la conversation qui commence ici, ainsi que les stratégies et les outils que nous énumérons, seront ramenés dans chacun de nos propres contextes, sur nos campus, dans nos salles de classe et dans notre communauté en général. Sans plus tarder, j'ai le plaisir d'inviter Miriam Elman, um, directrice de uh, the Academic Engagement Network. I lost it. Um, please welcome Miriam Elman, the Executive Director of the Academic Engagement Network. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of my colleagues and I, it's a pleasure to be here on your beautiful campus on a beautiful Sunday morning uh, in your lovely city. It's my first time here in Ottawa, and it, it's, a, it's a true pleasure. Um, and uh, I'd like to start by giving a shout out to my colleagues, uh, Carrie Cogan, Deidre Butler, co-chairs for today's program and the weekend events uh, for all the time they put in for expertly organizing uh, this event. And please join me again in applauding both. It's an honor to be moderating today's panel. And as Carrie mentioned, my colleagues and I are here this weekend to share our organization's expertise. For eight years, the AEN has been working to engage, educate, and empower a faculty network in the United States, a network of scholars committed to a robust campus discourse on Jewish identity in Israel, a network of faculty who speak out against anti-Semitism when it appears and who are fiercely committed to the bedrock principles of the academy, open inquiry and the free exchange of ideas. I am proud of what we have accomplished. We've grown into a network of nearly 900 faculty across 250 campuses in the United States. And now how delighted we are that there is an opportunity for such a network to be established here in Canada, tailored to your own unique perspectives, to your own legal frameworks and your own cultures. This weekend, my colleagues and I look forward to sharing with Carrie, with Deidre and their Canadian faculty, some of the best practices that we in AN have learned, some of the pitfalls that they can perhaps avoid and how they can move forward to hopefully establishing a Canadian faculty network. How wonderful that you have already garnered strong support for this idea from important stakeholders and from fellow faculty on your campuses and elsewhere. We wish you the best of luck as you embark on this critically important project and look forward to seeing all that you accomplish. We meet today to discuss a critically important and concerning topic anti-Semitism in Canada and how it can be combated. Our panelists will focus primarily on the campus space. They will present to you the legal frameworks in place, the recourses available to Jewish students, faculty, and staff, and the ways that anti-Semitism is being experienced today on far too many Canadian campuses. With that said, it is a pleasure to introduce our esteemed speakers for today's event. You have their bios in the program at your seat, so I won't take time to read them. It just would take up the whole next hour. They're really very distinguished panelists. Um, so I will just introduce their names in turn, and they will each have about 10 or so minutes to speak. And uh, hopefully we will have some time for your comments and questions from the floor. It is my great pleasure to introduce University of Ottawa President and Vice Chancellor Jacques Fremont. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour tout le monde. Bienvenue à l'Université d'Ottawa sur notre campus euh, ce matin et bienvenue en particulier à nos collègues de Carleton. On est ravis de votre, votre présence. Merci de l'invitation à venir euh, m'adresser à vous euh, ce matin. Uh, and uh, I firmly believe that what we will say this morning will benefit all groups on our campus, not just the Jewish community, but that conversation is extremely important for all our communities. And uh, my message this morning will be 
uh, we're different from the U.S. legally, uh, and uh, I like to believe we're a little more subtle than the First Amendment in terms of freedom of expression, uh, but uh, that we deserve better on university campuses in Canada than just the bare minimum in terms of freedom of expression. And I will uh, take you through the journey we had at the University of Ottawa over the last two years on, on these issues. So it will be both the university administrator, but also uh, the legal scholar who is addressing you this morning. But uh, I'm in, in extremely good company this morning, so I, I pay respect to Adam and everything he will say uh, on, the legal, on the legal side. Of course, needless to say that freedom of expression on campuses is crucial. It's crucial to academic freedom. I won't waste much time on that. And I was given 13 minutes, so I hope I will be able to squeeze everything in. My normal unit is three hours uh, to share with students. So <laughs> it's, a bit, uh, it, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, but freedom of expression uh, is not a well understood con concept and we might want to discuss that. But uh, certainly for me on this campus, uh, it means to be ex not only able to express oneself, but to express his or her identity to the fullest possible. And identities are complex, uh, are complex and varied. It varies with individuals. So the identity has to be able to be expressed as fully as possible without fear of hate, but also without fear of discrimination, reprisals of, of, of any sort. Uh, and that's what we, we owe uh, to our university uh, communities. Of course, in the US, it's a challenge. Uh, you've read about what is going on on many campuses. You, you've read about what governors and state authorities are imposing, uh, full freedom of expression, uh, but also full censorship of some books, uh, which are disturbing. We're not there yet in Canada, but it doesn't mean that it is not coming and there are signs coming from various political parties, from various uh, provinces, uh, and uh, clearly uh, from my former province, the province of Quebec, there's a healthy but very vigorous debate. Uh, and it's all started about the possibility to use the N word, uh, and people insist that they have the right to use that word, and they do have a right to use that word, but people have a right not to be insulted by 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 words which are being used. So that is the sort of background of the crisis at the University of, of Ottawa we we had. Um, we we had three or four years ago a couple of racist incidents. I mean and 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 they were painful, they were difficult, and members of our black communities uh, uh, suffered, I mean, uh, injuries and things. So so that was not easy. And at some point a couple of years ago, uh, the N-word issue uh, came up. Uh, and as you know, the University of Ottawa is bilingual, French and English. We're more than bilingual. I mean, we're bicultural. <laughs> and clearly there was a clash between uh, what I would say a Francophone Quebec identity culture and, and other cultures in Canada. Uh, what was clear for the Canadian side was not clear at all for 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 many uh, for many Quebec uh, for some of our Quebec uh, faculty, and um, it went on and on. And believe me, right in the middle of the pandemic, it became the one issue in Quebec. Uh, it was, uh, and the government, uh, the Quebec government, instrumentalized the the issue so that uh, the treatment of people, especially senior citizens during the pandemic was sort of forgotten for a couple of months. Um, and it, it sort of put a lot of pressure on, on, on us as an establishment, as an institution. So what do you do when you have pressure on an institution in a university? You form a committee. So we did form a committee. Uh, <laughs> The Honorable Michel Bastarache, uh, former Supreme Court of Canada judge, uh, chaired that committee. And we made sure that there were representatives from all wings in the uh, on that committee. It issued a report, which is available uh, on, on the web. 
And the report, not surprisingly, said that freedom of expression is crucial for any university, including the University of Ottawa, that there should be proper complaint mechanism, that there should be a reaffirmation by the University of Ottawa of the importance of academic freedom and freedom of expression. Uh, and there should be a committee overseeing the complaints mechanism. So no rocket science, but uh, it had the merit of being one of the only, we had the merit of being one of the only institutions in Canada which went through that exercise. Um, however, the report by itself for me as an administrator was not rich enough uh, in terms of, uh, of preparing for a statement by the community. How are we going to state and declare the importance of academic freedom and uh, freedom of expression? But within the complexity of a university and with all the conflicting values, and of course, the debate about racism was, was very present and still is very present on, on our campus, and rightly so. It is a very important uh, debate. And of course, the, the position seems very difficult to conciliate between the hardcore tenants of uh, of uh, full freedom of expression, the only limit being hate speech, and those who said that no freedom of expression should be somehow put into its context. So we, we what we did, we formed a second committee, uh, and but that committee's mandate was was more technical, but uh, was to make it operational. And we uh, finally adopted the Senate adopted the statement. Okay, so we have the policy, the official policy, the government's forced us, the conservative government forced us to adopt. It, it says all the right things, but it was useless during the crisis we had. So now we have on top of that a statement, and that was adopted a couple of months ago unanimously by the Senate. Unanimity in a Canadian Senate and a university is a rare beast. Uh, and and it's almost non non-existent. So so this is it. It tells a lot, I think, about uh, the, the the statement in question. The statement, and I urge you to uh, go. It's on the web, but the statement reaffirms the importance and necessity of academic freedom and freedom of expression, so on and so forth. You hear the violence, uh, but then, and that's I think is 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 a very useful, that statement is a useful tool for me as a university administrator, for Kerry as a faculty member, for students as, as members of the community and everyone, because it, 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 it puts pieces of the puzzle which should be considered in assessing in any given situation, the freedom of expression issue. So it says first, we condemned racist, discriminatory and hateful speech. So it is more than strictly hateful speech. Discriminatory speech is also included and, and, and racist speech and affirm that under no circumstances can a person hide behind freedom of expression or academic freedom to justify such speech. So you cannot invoke uh, full uh, academic, full, full freedom of expression uh, to 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 uh, to go on with racist, discriminatory, and hateful speech, uh, and we recognize, and that is very important, that respect, dignity, and inclusion are essential to learning and to the equal exercise of freedom of expression. So it 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 focuses on what's around freedom of expression, and respect, dignity, and inclusion are essential in that respect, and then. It went on, what do we do in a university? We research and we teach. In a classroom, freedom of expression is framed by the power relationship which exists between the faculty member, the, the, the professor, and the student. So you can't ignore that power relationship. So the statement says, no word, concept, idea, work, or image can be barred a priori from using the teaching and research context, but we acknowledge, and that is important, the importance of the following elements when implementing freedom of expression. Uh, and in a university context, first, the setting. 
is the expression in a classroom, lecture, informal discussion, so on and so forth. Second, the statement context. Was it made in teaching, research, examination? The status of the speaker has to be taken into account. Undergraduate, graduate student, full-time, part-time professor, so on and so forth. The audience and the power relations and inequalities that exist between members of the university community. So you cannot, it's not a zero or a one, okay? It's somewhere in between and you have to take all the elements in their context. And finally, it said, and that is very important, freedom of expression must be interpreted in the context of the interdependence of rights. And in particular, its connection to, and that is fundamental, the right to equality and dignity. Okay, so, and we know that legal scholars, the right to dignity is one of the most, all rights are equal, but the right to dignity is, is more equal than others, if I may say. Uh, so, so, and, and uh, that statement is complex. It sets the freedom of expression within the framework, a larger framework and a framework which is unique to university uh, teaching. So, uh, and I know Adam will complete their other, other mechanisms, legal mechanisms. What this statement does is to stick to a recent Supreme Court of Canada decision, horrific decision, in ward against uh, Commission des droits de la personne du Québec, okay? And, and to be frank, I was the one who initiated the proceedings at the Commission des droits de la personne du Québec when I was president then, okay? So we lost at the end a five to four judgment. And our statement, I would say, sticks not to the majority view, but to the minority view of the judgment. Okay, and, and basically I invite you to read the word judgment if you think that it's only the Supreme Court, uh, the US Supreme Court, which in which there are tensions, you will see Supreme Court of Canada, the Harper appointed judges carried the day. And there are good reasons to believe that now the same, the same case would be decided five to four in the other direction. That, that's, that's pretty clear. So we stick to the uh, dissenting judgment, and the dissenting judgment insists on the importance of discrimination, discriminatory speech not being acceptable. Where are we, and I will end there, where are we on our campus? The problem with law is that we always deal with a zero or a one, okay? And the zero or the one, there's a threshold. There's a legal threshold and you're in or you're out. And, and part of the issue in dealing with freedom of expression is that usually we're not, we're in between the zero and the one. And it's nuanced and, and, and it should be nuanced. Uh, the conversation should be uh, nuanced. So we like to believe in Canada now, full freedom of expression guaranteed by the Canadian Charter if it applies uh, to universities. Uh, that is another issue we won't get in this uh, this morning. Uh, we're bound by the Human Rights Code, the Ontario Human Rights Code, or in the other in the other provinces. But these are minimum thresholds, and I would urge, and I urge my understanding, and what we fight for in this university is to be to go above the minimum, because the community wants it, and because it 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 sticks to our deep uh, values. In freedom, of, and, and I want to, to end on this, in freedom of expression cases, challenges we have, and I see Noel Badiou who is sitting there, now is with Carlton, but he had to manage many, many, many of these cases. The solution is not necessarily the legal solution where you file a grievance or you file a formal complaint. In many instances, when there are issues in the classroom, they're being negotiated within the classroom between the, the, the teacher and the students, sometimes with the help of, of people who are knowledgeable. And that really makes a difference. When you go to the formal way, you're, you're in trouble. But the formal way has to be accessible. There has to be support for the informal way. Students have to be able to know 
on which door to knock when they think that there is a difficulty of freedom of expression, when they think they've been victims of, a, 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 of an aggression, a microaggression. So, so for us, for me as administrator, the, the essence of the challenge is really to make it the sort of collective project to really protect freedom of expression, academic freedom for all groups and all communities on our campus, and that people feel extremely comfortable in their identity on their campus. On this campus, you have students coming from 155 countries around the world. This is the United Nations, and we're very proud of that. But if we want to be successful, each and every of these students and members of our communities has to be comfortable in his or her identity. So it's a cultural shift. We're invited more than a legal shift. Our statement helps, I think, and support that cultural shift. I've not seen any document as advanced as that concerning freedom of expression on a Canadian campus. Uh, I'm giving a conference in two days' time to Universities Canada, and I suspect the statement will be taken again and again by many universities. It's a it's a very good statement. Uh, but this being said, uh, it is not the end of the process. It is maybe just the beginning, but we, we have to change that, that, that culture. And for conferences like this one is precisely will be very helpful to keep the conversation alive. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Uh, but uh, thank you so much, um, uh, President Fremont, for, for your leadership. And uh, we always say at AEN that it starts from the top, and you need to have a university president or chancellor who serves as the moral compass. And, and you certainly do on this campus, and, and very fortunate. Our next speaker is Professor Adam Dodick, the Faculty of Law, University of Ottawa. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, merci beaucoup. I, I wanna start by thanking and acknowledging the leadership of Dr. Kogan and Dr. Butler for your organization of today's seminar, uh, but also for all of the work that you're doing. This is a very serious and at times a, a negative subject. And I wanna to turn to a, a couple of marks of positivity. And that is that we are fortunate to have exceptional leadership at the two universities in this city with President Bacon and President Fremont who are here today. And in the past, the universities of Ottawa and Carleton University have not always worked so well together. And there have been rivalries. And this is a wonderful example of the two universities, the two presidents, two professors, faculties, programs coming together to work together to support students, staff, and faculty. I also want to recognize the exceptional leadership of Evelyn Greenberg, a woman whose passion and love for the University of Ottawa is matched only by her passion and love for the Jewish community and for the community of Ottawa generally. And her leadership on this file has been absolutely essential. I had both the privilege as well as the burden of serving as Dean of the Faculty of Law at the Common Law Section of the University of Ottawa during COVID. And a couple of months into the crisis, the responsibilities and the priorities for me as Dean and the faculty really crystallized. A crisis has that ability. And instead of thinking about balancing all of these different competing concerns, the priorities became crystal clear. I realized that it was my responsibility as Dean to protect our students, to protect our staff, and to protect our faculty. And I think that when we're talking about today's issue, that is the fundamental responsibility 
of university leadership to protect students, staff, and faculty so that they can learn, work, teach, and research in a safe environment that allows them to develop and flourish and grow. In that context, the comments by, I was going to say Professor Fremont, because before President Fremont became a university administrator, he was one of Canada's leading constitutional lawyers and constitutional theorists. So his comments are, are a very good sort of building block and helpful to me. And as his ending remarks really were about a caution about the limits of the law and the limits of legal powers. And I always tell my students that you should have a title for your presentation. And I didn't have one until the very end of President Fremont's presentation. And so I realized that my presentation is about the limits and the possibilities of legal tools that are available to us. And there are a number of legal and policy tools that are available to address anti-Semitism on university campuses. Each of them has advantages and disadvantages that are important to recognize. Some of them apply generally to all settings, including university ones, and those include the criminal law, human rights codes, and civil actions. Others are unique to universities and unique to particular universities. They include university policies like the statement on academic freedom that President Fremont spoke about. I'm going to begin with the criminal law and hate crimes because so much of the discourse around anti-Semitism and hate starts with hate crimes and is framed by hate crimes. Anti-Semitism is a species of hate, certainly one of the oldest and the most continuous forms of hate. Now I have to offer a caveat before I begin. And that caveat is I am not a criminal lawyer or a criminal, and the criminal law is not my expertise. There are many people, certainly some sitting in the audience today, who know much more than me on this subject, and I hope they'll contribute to the discussion and set me straight. I am a constitutional law professor and a lawyer who had the privilege for working for the Attorney General of Ontario some years ago. The criminal law is the strongest sanction that we have. It is a sanction by the state that expresses societal denunciation of dangerous and antisocial behavior. Make no mistake about it. The criminal law has the power to take away an individual's liberty, and it is for these reasons that there are many protections and safeguards attached to it, including constitutional ones. For all of these reasons, the criminal law will only be a tool in responding to anti-Semitism in the most extreme of cases. There are two notable provisions of the criminal code that deal with hate propaganda. Section 318 makes it a crime to advocate genocide, and Section 319 makes it a crime to incite hatred against an identifiable group where such incitement is likely to lead to a breach of the peace, and section sub two says, or to willfully promote hatred against any identifiable group. It is that subsection that is most quoted, most well known to people. Because an identifiable group means any section of the public distinguished by color, by race, by religion, national or ethnic origin, age, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, or mental or physical disability. This year, Parliament amended the criminal code to add a new offense entitled the willful promotion of anti-Semitism. It's important to note the narrowness of this offense because it only applies to the willful promotion of anti-Semitism by condoning, denying, or downplaying the Holocaust. There are many hate incidents out there. Unfortunately, by recent studies, hundreds each year. Not all hate incidents will meet the definition of a hate crime. And many hate incidents will not be prosecuted. 
And there are a number of explanations for this. The first reason is the same reason that many other crimes are not prosecuted. Some are not reported to the police. In some cases, witnesses are not willing or able to testify. The evidence may be insufficient to proceed, etc. But there is a second reason that is unique to hate crimes, and that is because they are treated differently than most other crimes. In most cases, the police investigate crimes, they arrest people, they charge them with an offense under the criminal code, and then they pass the file along to Crown prosecutors who decide how to proceed from there. Now, let me just take the temperature of the audience for a moment. How many of you have watched at least one episode of Law and Order? Maybe a different, you know, a demographic there. <laughs> if you've seen Law and Order or many cop TV shows, you'll be familiar with this model. However, hate crimes are part of a very small group of crimes where the system works very differently. The consent of the attorney general is required before hate crimes can be laid. And the reason for this is because they involve a restriction and a criminalization on freedom of expression. The constitutionality of that was upheld by the Supreme Court of Canada in the famous Keegstra case, where a teacher in Alberta was charged with willfully promoting hatred against an identifiable group by teaching his high school students that Jews were treacherous, subversive, sadistic, money-loving, power-hungry, and child killers. He taught his class that Jewish people seek to destroy Christianity and are responsible for depressions, anarchy, chaos, wars, and revolution. According to Mr. Keekstra, Jews created the Holocaust to gain sympathy, and in contrast to quote-unquote open and honest Christians, were said to be deceptive, secretive, and inherently evil. Mr. Keegstra expected his students to reproduce his teachings in class and on exams, and if they failed to do so, their marks suffered. Now, I mention this in detail for a couple of reasons. Mr. Keegstra taught this for decades. It is an extreme case, and the Supreme Court sharply divided on the constitutionality of the application of the hate inciting hate law in this case. It was a 4-3 decision. The Supreme Court held that the hate crime provisions did infringe the right to freedom of expression, but they were justifiable as a reasonable limit on that freedom in a free and democratic society. There are similar provisions in provincial and in the past in the federal human rights legislation. They provide civil remedies for discrimination and expressions of hate against protected groups. And the constitutionality of those were reaffirmed by the Supreme Court in 2013. As President Fremont said, such provincial human rights codes apply in the university contexts. Many universities, like the University of Ottawa, have enacted their own policies against discrimination and harassment, which often mirror or expand on human rights codes. Thus, here at the University of Ottawa, we have policy 67A on the prevention and harassment of discrimination, which is administered by our human rights office. Importantly, the university has a brand new policy on student rights and responsible conduct. This went into effect in May of this year. And I want to commend President Fremont and the university leadership for this much needed initiative. There are a number of purposes to this policy document. The first is to promote and maintain a respectful, healthy and safe university learning, living and work environment. This policy recognizes that all students have the right to be treated with respect and dignity and without harassment and discrimination. It states that all students are expected to act responsibly when engaging with other members of the university community, and it provides for sanctions when a student commits a breach of responsible conduct. 
A breach of responsible conduct may include abusive conduct that threatens the physical or mental well-being of another student or online comment conduct that intimidates or seriously threatens to inflict harm on another student or group of students. I cannot underscore enough the importance of this new policy to protect the well being of students. Sadly, some hate incidents involve violence or the threat of violence. A number of years ago, there was a notorious incident at McGill where a student leader tweeted, punch a Zionist. The, the, the nakedness of that threat and exposing the hollowness of the claim that anti-Zionism is not targeting Jews is exposed by tweets such as that, or tweets that were mentioned, social media postings that were mentioned in, uh, in the video about postings, hate, hateful postings to accounts of Jewish people conducting Jewish religious ceremony. Ontario law prohibits workplace harassment and workplace violence and requires all employers to have policies to prevent both. Thus, here at the University of Ottawa, as in other employers, we have a policy on violence prevention and a policy on preventing harassment and discrimination that I mentioned before that deals with workplace harassment. In, uh, in conclusion, as I thought about this, and I thought about where we've come over the past 10 years. And I, unfortunately, I, I agree with Dr. Kogan and Dr. Butler and others that the situation has, uh, in terms of anti-Semitism, and especially threats to our students, but also threats to our faculty, has become much worse over the past decade than it was 10 or 20 years ago. But, the positive message is the tools that we have, the Human Rights Office, the Statement on Academic Freedom, the Policy 67A on Preventing Discrimination and Harassment, the Code of Student Rights and Responsibilities, the, tool, the legal and policy tools that we have are much, much stronger than they were 5, 10, let alone 20 years ago. And I believe that we have the available tools in order to be able to start to confront anti-Semitism and to protect our students, our staff, and our faculty. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Professor Dodek, for walking us through the, the case law, the frameworks available, the policies available, and, and the note of optimism, which I think is important you know, on this difficult topic, that there, that there are ways we can address the issues and address them in light of our principles, our values, and, and, and the law as well. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you over Zoom, uh, Michal uh, kotler Wunsch, who is a former member of Israel's Knesset uh, and a colleague as well. Uh, and uh, thank you so much, Michal, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I'm humbled to be joining uh, this incredible floor is panel. yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Um, I'm very, very humbled to be joining this really incredible panel of experts on what is such an important topic. And uh, of course, as a Canadian, Israeli, Israeli Canadian, I find it a very important um, and meaningful place in which to engage, not only as a proud Canadian, but as one that believes that Canada has a very important, critical role as a trustee of these foundational principles to which Canada is so committed to. And I'm sorry that I'm not there um, to be there in person and to continue really where Professor Dodek left off with regards to the tools. I wanna dig a little deeper into the tools of discussion today. And the topic is of course, combating anti-Semitism. And anti-Semitism 
has in fact been defined. It is a critical non-legally binding resource, the result of nearly 20 years of a democratic process, the IHRA working definition of anti-Semitism that I wanna highlight. And I, I want to do so really through my own um, uh, 10 year experience that began with researching speech codes on university campuses, call it the attempt to regulate free speech on university campuses, while at the very same time, recognizing that Jewish students actually weren't protected by the safe spaces and microaggressions and trigger warnings afforded to all other students in the showing of annual Israel apartheid weeks on campus. And over the decade that many of you have referred to, of course, um, I, I would like to add sort of an additional lens and that is the intersection of the reality on university campuses with that of online and digital space in which of course there is a complete blurred boundaries at this point with what happens on the digital um, um, platforms and what happens off of them on campus or on streets. So really, and as many of you have mentioned already over the last several years, there's been an alarming increase in anti-Semitic incidents across the globe, including university campuses. And today the apparent majority um, uh, apparently, the, uh, the apparent majority originate online, as I mentioned, as part of a larger hate and disinformation campaign seen on both mainstream and dark web platforms that we have to be aware of as well. Research shows that anti-Semitic tropes, memes, and rhetoric are often incorporated in other online conspiracy theories, with a Swedish academic expert recently um, stating that at the core of the threat to liberal democracy, is anti-Semitism, labeling anti-Semitism online as the mother of conspiracy theories. And I think that we have to take it into, into account in addition to what we saw over the COVID sort of 19 um, 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 pandemic. Uh, this hate online is not just harmless chatter relegated to the dark corners of the internet. And as I said, it spills into our campuses and into the streets. And I do share anecdotally that as a legislator holding um, hearings in Israel's parliament, I was flooded with students around the world that for the first time during COVID, because everything went online, even before hybrid realities such as this, line, as this one, when everything went online, there was no escaping. They couldn't choose not to go to the space in which Israel apartheid weeks were taking place. And they were flooded with anti-Semitic rhetoric and memes. Combating this global hatred requires a global solution with universities at the forefront. Further, the case and cause of online anti-Semitism presents an opportunity and responsibility, not only for policymakers and civil society organizations, but I would argue for universities, the ecosystem in which students are actually able to contend with or um, um, uh, be afforded the opportunity to engage with critical thinking in order to create comprehensive recommendations, solutions, and the ability to cope with what it is that they face not only on campus, but off campus. In July of 2020, uh, a No Safe Space for Do It campaign took place globally. It began on Twitter actually as a result of several very, very virulent anti-Semitic um, tweets that were referred to um, before in order to combat the virulent anti-Semitism that goes unaddressed or inadequately addressed on social media platforms. Even as universities, as I said, moved to online studying, learning, and students were bombarded with the intersection of that um, um, anti-Semitic campaign. Growing urgency led to initiating and leading not only hearings in Israel's Knesset, but actually an interparliamentary multi-partisan task force to combat online anti-Semitism together with uh, partners and parliamentarians around the world in Canada and the US and the UK and in Australia. And that actually task force has grown since to additional members serving really as a consistent voice committed to protecting all from online, hate and its real world manifestations, underscoring that the fight against anti-Semitism is a nonpartisan, non-political consensus, transcending real and perceived differences of geography, of religion, of language, and more. The task force has worked to enable this consistent messaging and not only from legislators, but working across with social media um, um, platforms and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, um, organizations around the world. And 
the demand for exactly what I began with, i.e. the adoption and implementation of that non-legally binding resource, because in order to identify and combat a problem, we first, and there are many lawyers in the room that can teach me this, have to define it. And anti-Semitism, as I said, luckily for us, exists as a definition, a resource, to be utilized exactly for this purpose by universities in order to be able to identify and combat and train DEI officers, students, and faculty as to what anti-Semitism is in order to raise awareness on what's to, to, of, of the entire gamut to what's happening um, and to um, acknowledge the tremendous responsibility that we have in our generation and to actually underscore using those mechanisms that exist on university campuses that if one minority or one group or one religion or one um, ethnic um, um, group as self-defined by itself cannot be protected um, by hate speech policies that exist or you know conduct policies that exist on the various campuses then ultimately none can. I want to underscore that the IRA um, uh, uh, consensus definition of anti-Semitism is a comprehensive definition. It is a comprehensive definition that enables, and here I'm humbled to quote my own father, Canada's anti-Semitism envoy, that enables to track and address what we know of as traditional anti-Semitism that barred the individual Jew from an equal place in society to what we know of the mutated or mainstreamed form that actually attempts to bar the Jewish nation state from an equal place among the nations. And I will add there, and all who support it. And all who support it is a very critical piece because Zionism has in many ways undergone uh, a, a complete uh, a process that has appropriated international law and its mechanisms around the world to actually turn Zionists or all those that self-define as Zionists to the equivalent of the worst, most pejorative terms that we can um, um, reference. So that, for example, in universities that list students that are not welcome members of book clubs, you will find anti-Semites, racists, and Zionists, so that we understand the reality in which students are facing. And we saw that clip of, of the lived experiences of students on campus and what that looks like, including actually preventing them from equal access to resources of publicly funded universities, not only in Canada, but around the world. As the international consensus definition established, as I mentioned, after years of a democratic process, and it's been adopted, and this is very important, by hundreds of entities, including 38 countries and cities and sports leagues and major corporations and universities, um, that definition um, has to be utilized in a way that, um, that, that enables to um, implement what we know of and what we've heard of that exists, including at University of Ottawa, and um, and, and prevents the sort of algorithmic capabil capability of online hate to um, refer to uh, killing or death to Zionists and, and actually, and we heard some of the lived experiences of students or punch a Zionist and get away with it because what was flagged or what is removed content, and I would prefer if it was flagged and not removed, I can uh, maybe get into that a little bit after as well, but flagged content that would say, Punch a Jew would be removed, but punch a Zionist is not removed because, um, because of the um, definitions or lack thereof. Regardless of the fact that this description, Zionist, refers to the majority of Jews and many non-Jews who um, identify with and support the right of the state of Israel to exist as what it was founded to be, i.e. the nation state of an indigenous people returned to an ancestral homeland after millennia of exile and persecution committed to equality. And that is just Israel's declaration of independence, its founding document that states its vision, mission, and values. Without this hate against the majority of Jews, who, as I said, self-defined as Zionists, or by the way, are presumed to be Zionists if they are visible Jews, um, as well as well as many non-Jews who um, support Israel's right to exist cannot be combated. Knowing the real world harm and intimidation and the lived experience we've heard of, of Jewish students in, on Canadian campuses and in other campuses as well, that excludes Zionists from equal access, access and participation to, as I mentioned, university books, book clubs or support groups for vic victims of sexual harassment and the league list goes on and on. And as we've heard in class as well, 
is an unacceptable reality. The mutation of anti-Semitism, this toxic, ancient hatred, um, um, enabled by what I refer to as the appropriation and weaponization of foundational principles to demonize, delegitimize, and apply a double standard to Israel. And that is one of the examples listed in the IRA working definition. And by the way, it's very important that I say that the IRA working definition it specifically stipulates that criticism of the state of Israel is allowed just like criticism of any other country, differentiating criticism of any country from the delegitimizing of any country, which we have heard nothing about any other single country in the world other than the one single Jewish and democratic state. The trigger for the creation of the IRA working definition is very important to note as well. A non -legally, this non-legally binding resource was the result of the 2001 Durban Conference Against Racism, the pretext for what became an anti-Semitic hate fest, a milestone in the systematic appropriation of human rights to advance and conflate Israel with apartheid South Africa, a mutation of the earlier 1975 Zionism is Racism UN resolution revoked decades later. It is part of the recognition that where conventional warfare failed to annihilate Israel, a war for hearts and minds, implementing a systematic strategy can gain traction. Appropriating Zionism, a 140 year old progressive national liberation movement built on millennia old identity, integral to the character, heritage, religion, ancestry, culture of Jews worldwide, most of whom identify as Zionists, has rendered their identity synonymous with the gravest of human crimes, enabling to legitimately include it in the list of isms, excluding and denying Zionists from equal access, rights, or participation in university campus and off it. In order to ensure equal access to opportunity, safety, and protection from harm for all, and I think that um, uh, President uh, Fremont said this so, so clearly. This is about all students. It's not about Jewish students. And this is about the cause of all universities, not only those concerned with the protected protection or combating of anti-Semitism, including those who identify as Zionists and regard it as an integral part of their identities that is not just able to be shed. Um, it must be added to existing detailed lists of those protected characteristics, by the way, which some of the, um, the social media companies have and some of the um, conduct, uh, 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 codes of conduct of universities include as protected characteristics. Uh, it is vital that universities and administrators and faculty take responsibility to identify and to be able to address this mutating hate. It is critical to, to create the mechanisms within each of the universities, and I'm really so uh, delighted to hear the participation between universities and the learning experience that the uh, AEN has to be able to give the equivalent in Canada. And I just want to, I, I do want to touch upon the understanding that the understanding that free speech, whether it's different in First Amendment understanding or the more nuanced Canadian uh, 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 approach and understanding of freedom of speech does not allow for freedom of reach. And the freedom of reach that we are experiencing in this global reality age is very different than the one and maybe even can be argued by constitutional law experts that are present in this forum that the clear and present danger of shouting fire or falsely shouting fire in a, in a crowded theater actually applies in more than one way um, to the current reality of misinformation and disinformation that's disseminated um, in, in, in the online reality. I want to end here, but I just want to um, sum up by saying that as a first and critical step, it is clear that in order to be able to address the rising real world harm real world intimidation of university students. It is critical to utilize this existing resource that I um, uh, refer to the IRA working definition of anti-Semitism. And it is very important, not only as a top-down understanding of the IRA working definition, to include Zionist in whatever protected characteristic or code of conduct that exists in universities so that those students that I've spoken to around the world in North America and beyond have said to me, you know, this year I decided to come out as a Zionist. That is a reality in which in 2022, nearly 2023, 
all of us have the responsibility to address and to end on a hopeful note. I do want to say, and Miriam El Elman just pu published a very important article on the um, potential of utilizing the Abraham Accords, because that is also the era that we are living in. The importance of the Abraham Accords as a, as a, as a real resource in the potential paradigm shift that recognizes Israel's right to exist as what it was founded to be, that enables the negotiation with its right to exist as what it was founded to be, and that ultimately paves the path for all in the region and beyond, utilizing this incredible understanding of shared ancestry and shared heritage of the Abraham Accords, and also the shared understanding of what anti-Semitism is, including by countries like Morocco and Bahrain and so on, that utilize this as re this incredible resource as their guidance. Um, so thank you. And again, I'm so sorry not to be there with you and appreciate so much those that went to great lengths to organize this opportunity and discussion. Thank you so much. I didn't expect to get a shout out for my article that just published um, on this panel. And I appreciate that, uh, an article up on our website uh, at the Academic Engagement Network, um, uh, 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 co-written with my colleague, uh, Rafa Shams, who is in the audience, um, and happy to talk to anybody about that after uh, the panel. Um, Michal, it's always uh, a pleasure, and thank you for your rich presentation and uh, for highlighting the challenges online, offline, and the way in which the IRA definition can be a useful educational tool for us. Uh, and at your conclusion, the importance that Jewish Zionist students and all students have the right to express their identities freely on campus, to have access to all spaces on campus. Uh, and thank you so much for, for highlighting that. We so appreciate having you here today. Thank you. Uh, and I would like to uh, call up Richard Marceau, who is Vice President for External Affairs and General Counsel at CJA. Pleasure. Thank you. Floor is yours. Thank you. Speaking after Professor President Fremont, Professor Dodek, Michal Katerwunsch, is there anything else that I can say? Um, so the, the, the good news for you is that I'll be much briefer because they were talking, so, okay, already said I was going to say this. Nope, can't say this again, can't say this again. Um, Dr. Kagan and uh, Professor Butler, uh, Ambassador Dr. Hoffman, um, fellow panelists. I guess after hearing what, what, what we just heard, I'll, I'll take a different tack than what I, I wanted to take. I, I want first to start by, by widening the lens a little bit, because we're focusing here today on the issue of anti-Semitism on campus. But what happens on campus has an impact in society in general, and as well what happens in society in general has an impact on campus. Campuses are not in a vacuum. Um, and what students live here uh, is transferred outside and what people and Jews live outside of campus also has an impact on campuses across, across the country. Um, it was mentioned, I believe by Deirdre, sorry, Professor Butler, Deirdre, uh, Deirdre, okay, um, that Statistics Canada have shown year after year that Jews are the most targeted uh, religious minority in terms of hate crimes. That is a fact. Um, we also know that we are seeing what I, I would call a mainstreamization of anti-Semitism, what used to be only active in, in the far right and the hard left and some other uh, areas or circles of society is now creeping in mainstream. So we have one of the most popular artists, Kanye West, not to mention him, who has more followers on social media than there are Jews in the world peddling anti-Semitism online, but it, 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 it goes offline too. And it led to, for example, people in LA uh, putting banners on top of freeways, say Kanye is right about the Jews. Um, we're seeing our own government that has given, and now thank God they're, they're modifying the policy, $133,000 to a guy who under the cover of, of fighting racism was actually an act of anti-Semitism. 
And despite the fact that the Kenyan government had adopted the IRA definition as part of this anti-racism strategy that was supposed to be a whole of government approach, still managed to get not only those $133,000 from, uh, from Heritage Canada, but got other money from the CRTC. Even though he's peddling vile and toxic anti-Semitism. Um, so this is what we're, we're facing. This is what we have to... Um, to deal with. Uh, President uh, Fremont said, uh, talked about the, the, uh, the statement that came from, from the Senate. And one of the things that he said in this presentation that I found very interesting is that you cannot hide behind freedom of expression to promote not only hateful, but discriminatory speech. That is, to me, very, very fundamental in what we're dealing with now. Um, and the other thing that he mentioned is the importance of context. He mentioned that law is sometimes very binary. And it's interesting that both uh, President Fremont, Professor Dodek, um, Michal as well, and, and, and me as a lawyer all say that even though law is important, law has limits. Law has its limits in, 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 what, it, in what it can do. Um, and I don't want to repeat what Michal just said, but that is why the IRA definition is so important and why it's so well written. There's a reason why it took 20 years to write because it's subtle, it's not vague. It is subtle, it, it, and it takes into, uh, into consideration context. And it goes exactly the same principle as the statement that, uh, that the university uh, standard put out, the importance of context. So all of those people who are fear-mongering about the IRA definition, who think it's the end of the world, it's a way to silence pro-Palestinian activism on campus, it is not that. And we have to make sure that people know that it is a blatant lie about a tool that is so fundamental uh, in the fight against anti-Semitism. Um, again, I don't want to repeat some what other uh, have said, um, but going back to the idea that that law is in itself limited. How do you legally deal with the fact that many uh, many entities on campus uh, do are not uh, are do not perceive Jews as a minority that is worth protecting. Is it a legal issue per se, or is it isn't it a training issue? Isn't it better to train staff and to train uh, faculty and to train students on what is and what isn't anti-Semitism than going in saying I'm going to sue everybody and their cousins? But there's a lot of work to do on that training. Isn't, it, isn't dialogue better than only legal, only using legal tools? A, a, a lawyer will tell you that a, a, the law is one tool in a toolbox. So training is another one. Um, uh, dialogue is another one. And it can work. So a lot of people don't know anything about Jews. They don't know, for example, that there are more Jews who think Israel is central to their identity than there are Jews who keep kosher or who keep Shabbat. If we were to ban kosher food on campus, people would say, oh, that's anti-Semitic. And it would be true. If people were to make sure to force observant Jews not to observe Shabbat, they would say, well, that's anti-Semitic. So why is it that when we talk about the centrality of the state of Israel, the return of the indigenous Jewish people to its ancestral land, and, and, and that when that is attacked, this would not be considered anti-Semitic? Who decides that? Why don't we ask Jews what they feel about this? I was sitting yesterday at Shul, my synagogue, KBI, here in Ottawa, and I was looking at the windows and in the windows, they have all the Jewish holidays. Uh, they have uh, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Purim, and all of those. And there's one called Yom Atzmaut, Independence Day of Israel. And there's a Jewish, uh, there's, a, there's Israel's flag and the Israel coat of arm. Because for Jews, Israel is central to their identity. That is why in my synagogue and most synagogues across the country, we say a prayer for the state of Israel. So all this to say what? Yes, we're focusing on the legal issue. We're focusing on the legal tools. It is one tool. Let's also look at all the others. 
and lets all of us be better at explaining what Jewish identity is, what Jewish, what Jewish identity means, and what it is important that this be protected, like every uh, identifiable groups under any form of human rights code, being the Ontario Code, uh, Human Rights Code, or the Charte des Droits et Libertés du Québec, or all of the others. We have a lot to a lot of work to do. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Kagan and uh, Deirdre, uh, for all the work you do. And let's get let's get to it. Thank you so much um, for these important points that that end our panel, um, and particularly that campus is not hermetically sealed. That's very important. What happens on campus doesn't stay on campus, and what happens in Las Vegas doesn't stay there either, right? Um, and so the 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 connection between the community, and it's why the community is so important in this conversation on how to address and combat anti-Semitism. The community is very important, and is 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 needs to be brought in and be part of the conversation. Uh, and then your point about the importance of education, training dialogue and conversation on campus. These are, these are the foremost um, methods and best practices that we use at AEN, and I think they resonated quite a bit with the faculty here that we've been talking with in Canada. Let me turn now uh, back over to uh, Professor Butler, who will um, take some questions from the floor. Thank have a little you. bit of time. I just wanna, I'm gonna ask Darlene, who's helping us out today. And uh, she's gonna be walking around with a microphone. So if you would like to speak, she's gonna walk to you. So I'd like to welcome some questions from the floor. And uh, if you could, if you could tell us your name, if you're willing to, but before I do that, I have to say, this event is being recorded. And so your questions and the answers are being recorded as well. So do be aware of that as we proceed. And if someone can put up their next hand so I know where Darlene's going next. Okay, thank you, Dina. So if you could tell Hello. us your name, if you don't mind. Sure, my name is Joel. I'm a Jewish guy from Winnipeg. Um, I moved here in uh, 2007 to attend the law school. And uh, in the course of studying and practicing law, never experienced any overt anti-Semitism. Um, and so it doesn't surprise me that Professor Dodik is here representing the faculty. Um, I'd just like to first commend uh, the co-chairs of the event and the Israeli Foundation for, for hosting. Uh, it's so important. Um, I will say that after pursuing my career in law, I pivoted and uh, went into the visual arts. And much to my surprise, the person who I asked to write a letter of recommendation for me said, you know, it's a great application, but they're never going to let an effing Jew into the program. And I was shocked because I never understood. Uh, and he is a Jew. Um, and in the course of studying at the uh, uh, University of Ottawa and the Faculty of Visual Arts, I experienced, you know, things uh, from the incident uh, uh, regarding the N-word to my own sort of um, uh, incidents. I guess what I, without getting into any of the details, I, I'm a recent graduate of the Master of Fine Arts program. Um, I guess what I'd just like to say uh, most importantly is that most people who experience, I commend the students for those remarks at the beginning, because when I was um, involved in the incident, I ended up at home in bed crying for two weeks. Honest to goodness, I couldn't get out of bed because I was so shaken up. I didn't know what doors to knock on. And I'm a lawyer and I'm an adult, you know, with real world experience, but I had, I had no idea where to turn. And it was traumatic. And I'm glad that I'm not gonna get into any details because it raises, what I think is a trauma. Um, so that's where the students are. They're at home crying. And um, I guess the other thing I'd say is that my other concern is that the people that need to be hearing this aren't in the room. You know, like some they, of them are. I'm we're glad. Very grateful that they're here. I'm glad. You know. And so in your in your further discussions, I just really encourage you to think of the strategies to take this conversation outside the choir to the broader community that doesn't think they need to be hearing this. 
Thank you. Um, if, if I can just say something as a professor, we're all in our bubbles in the university as well. And depending what department you're in or what you need to do, who your professor is, you have a very different experience of these things. And it, it's the leadership of people like people who are here right now who are so important for making differences. So thank you. Does anyone want to respond to just- well, I, I, would, I would just add thank you for your testimony and, 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 and for sharing that. Uh, it shows the long way ahead for us so that students understand where to go and how to be supported over and above the legal, the traditional legal remedy. It's also sort of mental health. It's also personal uh, wellness, which is which is in 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 on, on the line. So thank you, thank you for sharing that. Um, I hope we'll we're a better place, but I hope we will be a much better place uh, soon. Thanks. And thank you. We've got a question in the back and then in the front row. Hi, I'm I'm Stephen, a Jewish guy from Montreal. <laughs> Currently lives in Ottawa. Um, uh, I wanted to ask some of our panelists, uh, particularly uh, Richard and Michal, um, what advice do you, so we heard the story from my new friend from Winnipeg, who I, I'm guessing the prof wasn't being anti-Semitic. He was just saying that this is the reality that you face. I hope he wasn't, as, but my question, and it was the line you mentioned at the end, though he's Jewish. So what advice do you have when some of this, anti-Israel rhetoric, for lack of a better word, comes from fellow Jews. Um, uh, what advice do you give? Yes, there's a broader issue in the broader community, but as we say often, the Jews are their own worst enemy. What, what, what advice do you give when this kind of stuff is coming from your brothers and sisters? Michal, do you want to answer? Sure. Uh, maybe uh, I'll start by saying, and, and maybe it's an amalgamation of, 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 of my responses to both questions, because the truth is that the real courageous individuals in this story are actually the students. Um, I have been really, really amazed with the courage of students to stand up, but also with the tools that they have to discuss the issue of identity. So there is a generation out there that, and that's part of the tools that we have, including in the trainings of students and DEI officers, is that there is an entire generation of students that I am so impressed with because when it comes to identity, they understand that nobody can impose their perception of identity on me. And that's true whether they're Jewish or not, whether you know they're Zionist or not, or whether they're anything, you know. And and so across the board, and that's where I would say is the incredible opportunity that we have alongside this tremendous challenge. And I'm not naive, um, but alongside this tremendous challenge, I do believe that we are at an intersection with a generation of students who, of course, aren't going to remain students forever and are going to become leaders of corporations and, you know, uh, members of parliament and university presidents and faculty, an incredible um, generation that is open, willing and able not only to discuss their own identity, but the imperative to protect other people's self-definition of identity and to stand guard that nobody should be compromised, intimidated, or living a lived experience of real world harm, um, just like they are not. So maybe that's just a little bit of my two cents worth. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if, I, if, I, if I can add very quickly. Um, so the question was what to do, uh, Stephen, I think that's the answer. So there are resources on campus that, that exist, uh, people who deal with that uh, uh, constantly. There's Hillel on campus. It's a good address to, to knock on. Uh, I have a colleague here, Scott Goldstein at the end. He's going to say hi there. Uh, if uh, He's also uh, quite... Um, quite used to dealing with those with those uh, with those issues, um, but if I may, I, I want to add a little thing uh, to what I to my earlier remarks when the, my remarks about education and training and dialogue were about anti-Semitism and and what is and what is not anti-Semitism and Jewish identity. I will go a bit further if I'm allowed for forty five seconds. Um, People, some people, some groups will cloak themselves under the guise of social justice to actually demonize and attack the only Jewish state. 
Wanting Israel to disappear, wanting the only Jewish state to disappear is neither social nor just. It is not peaceful. It will not bring peace. So in terms of dialogue, I think our, our own community students should be better equipped, and that's our own fault. It's not a university issue. It's a Jewish community uh, issue. Should be better deal, uh, uh, better equipped to deal with the meaning of Zionism, the meaning of the state of Israel for Jews, the millennia long longing for having their state in their ancestral lands. We have to do better than that. If I could just add also to all of this, um, I love, Michal, that you're honoring the courage of our students and, and you're speaking about the resources, but I had a student who's applying to the London School of Economics, who's an Israel activist at Carleton, and she's been advised by many professors who are not self-hating Jews, take it off. And so there is a reality that we have to support our students through these treacherous waters. At the same time, we build up their strengths, their tools that we teach, that we educate, and we transform our campuses. There are people who are still caught up in them. And I, I want to also salute those who are suffering quietly and who are just trying their best, because not everyone can stand up for many reasons. I believe we had a question here in the front. Hi, I'm Dina Libman from the Azraeli Foundation, and we're so honored to be supporting um, this conference this weekend. In no small part, because we know that there's a lot of attention paid to what students face, but uh, universities and academic spaces are ecosystems that have so many players and uh, faculty play an important role in fostering the right kind of dialogue on campus. Um, but faculty are also, there's faculty on faculty um, aggression as there is faculty on student. Um, my question goes to the framework that you've all been describing where it's important to set up offices and all universities now have DEI offices um, where students can go when they are faced with um, challenges to their identity. What we hear from students and from faculty and from staff is that if a student were to come to that office and say an assignment that I received in my class or a comment that I received from a TA is counter to my identity as a trans person. It is seen as a line too far, it's unequivocal. If a student comes and says what my TA said, this assignment that I received is um, counter to my identity as a Zionist or counter to my identity as a Jew, the answer is often, well, we have to look at both sides. If a faculty member says, "My, I would like to take a study tour to Israel, the answer is not as warmly embraced as I would like to take my students on a study tour to Italy. Perhaps even I'd like to take my students on a study tour to China. And so what I'm trying to understand is how within this framework that you're laying out, can we address that two-sidedness, which is often the answer that is um, provided. Um, is there a lawyer in the room to protect <laughs> <laughs> people answer? No, I think it is, it, it, it is a, a very deep question and, and a very real question. And that's where, when I, I called for a change of culture, we need a collective change of culture. One of the stumbling blocks is right now is everyone feels entitled to their right and to claim their right. And they claim to be protected also from the administration uh, and to be protected by the administration about what is going on. 
and 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 so it it for us it becomes extremely difficult and 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 I I could testify to 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 places where faculty members are claiming to be protected from students and where students are claiming to be protected from faculty members and where faculty members are claiming to be protected from harassment from their colleagues from other faculty members and and as administrators we we're always stuck in between but the net result is that many people in their classrooms if they teach will be prudent they'll be more careful they won't be able to assert what they are and 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 their all their beliefs it's it's becoming and then they will say it's censorship coming and where is the censorship coming from administration and god knows where we're, we're nowhere to be seen. I mean, we're just trying to 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 have a healthy, uh, sane climate. So your question is extremely difficult to answer. I'm afraid. And when we're able to answer, we would have made progress. Have to go there. I think it's a really important and and, and a really difficult question. And um, I think that the challenge of it is exacerbated by Richard's point about what's going on in broader society. And I think as as Professor Framont was indicating, we we have a there's something going on not just on campuses, but in society where people think that that um, they have a right to do whatever they want to do. And that their right is not legally defined, is not defined by the state, is not defined by the university is defined by whatever they whatever they want, whatever they think. And that makes things all the more challenging. Um, and to me, the response, uh, I, I think of this in a sense as a constitutional law professor thinking about the rule of law. And as I tell my first year students, that means that the exercise of any, uh, of any power or any right has to be grounded in some authority. So I think that a student in the situation that you're talking about has the right to ask, you know, where is the policy that says that? Why are you treating, or the or the faculty member, what are the standards? What are the policies for study abroad trips? Why are, you know, I, am, why are you treating me differently than my colleague who wants to take a trip to, to Italy or to Croatia or to elsewhere? There are policies about that. And, you know, getting back into... We, we can't, getting back into the role of, of the students, I always say, you know, I also teach legal ethics, and I say we can't expect people to be heroes. We can't set standards of conduct that put the emphasis completely on the individual and expect everything, everyone to, to act as a hero. To me, when I watch the, the video of the students, I consider all of those students heroes. But I don't think it's fair to hold, to say to every other, every student, every staff, every faculty, act like them, go forward, be an advocate, et cetera. I think it's much more common the the experience that 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 Joel related. Where do you go to for support? And I think we are building those structures, certainly at the University of Ottawa, but at other campuses. The Human Rights Office, I always sent students, faculty to the human rights office, not to file a complaint. They can certainly do that, but to get advice and to get support from experts who are increasingly being trained in the full range of discrimination and hate. And that's why some of them are involved here today and across the country. So I think getting that support from, you know, whether it's whether it's from the Human Rights Office, whether it's from Hillel, Sija, elsewhere, and telling students where those supports can be found, whether they're Jewish students, trans students, other students, et cetera. Miriam wanted to add a remark, and then I've got three, now four questions on this side of the room coming. Just a, a quick remark from what we, um, here in AEN in terms of the classroom. Um, and in the, in the US context, students do not have a legal right to a balanced course. Um, so if there's a faculty member who is teaching a skewed course that 
brings in only BDS related narratives and is not providing information that presents a diverse viewpoint, right? The other side of the peer review literature. What we say is you're shortchanging the students, right? But that's just bad pedagogy. There's no real legal recourse there for the student. What, what, what university leadership can do is to provide that balance across the curriculum, hire different faculty, make sure there are different courses, make sure students are actually exposed to the diversity of the scholarship on Israel and the Middle East or, or any topic, right? So that becomes a leadership issue. Um, as a faculty for 25 years, I can tell you no faculty member wants their courses micromanaged. I don't want my course micromanaged. I don't want to micromanage other courses. But faculty do also have curriculum committees and they can look at and they can say, you know, you're, you're actually shortchanging the students here. What can we do? And then leadership can provide uh, uh, different types of courses and viewpoint diversity, diversity across the curriculum. In terms of DEI space, uh, we launched two years ago the Improving the Campus Climate Initiative, which we'll share more about with the faculty here and over the course of the next two days. And in in our we've we've now trained hundreds of uh, of administrators and staff in EDI or DEI. Uh, and uh, by and large, we have found they are well-meaning. They are very well-meaning, but they do not have the Jewish community in their radar screen. They're focused largely on gender and race issues, and that's their training. And so the key is to bring the Jewish community to have a seat on the table for them to understand that the Jewish community is part of their wheelhouse, that it cannot be shunted to Hillel or Chabad or to, because these are identity issues that the students are experiencing and grappling with and struggling with. And it's part of their offices to address those issues. This is not just an issue of not enough kosher food on campus or assign, you know, assigning uh, assignments on Yom Kippur, although those kinds of religious accommodations need to be understood as well. But we need to explain, as Richard mentioned, that Judaism is about peoplehood, that Zionism is central to most Jews, not all Jews. There are some Jews that are anti-Zionist, but most Jews, we have good data in Canada and the US on this. Most Jews see an attachment to Israel and Zionism as central to the way they define their Jewishness. That is something that we have to teach and educate all spaces on campus, including EDI. And we're doing that. I think it can be done here too as well. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. So there are two gentlemen who had questions back there, and then there's one, uh, now you're five, uh, Yael, uh, Mina is four, <laughs> and you're three. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is Daniel. I'm a student in the Faculty of uh, Law in the Civil Law section at the University of Ottawa. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for putting this together, and of course the panelists for your very informative uh, uh, talk. Uh, and of course, uh, Mr. Marceau and Professor Dodek, when I came here from uh, Montreal, when I moved here, I had the privilege of meeting your sons who welcomed me into the U Ottawa Jewish community very warmly. They're absolute gentlemen. And uh, it's reassuring to see this generational commitment to the Jewish community. Um, uh, my question is essentially, I, I, I begin by saying I don't necessarily share in your optimism, although I do appreciate it. Uh, given the long history of anti-Semitism, the dynamic nature of it, uh, the fact that it's constantly evolving. Um, my question is, are we expecting to see the numbers of anti-Semitism decline? Are we uh, hoping to sort of eliminate anti-Semitism on campuses? Um, and then if so, is the best approach really, as you mentioned, Dr. Elman, a top-down approach, or is there a sort of bottom-up approach that we should be looking at as students? Is there something we should be doing uh, to help push that forward? Uh, yeah, if there's any uh, comment, have we, and have we, seen, have we seen it actually be achieved on any campus, uh, whether in the States or anywhere in the world? Have we seen these, these sorts of uh, solutions be implemented and successfully, if anyone can comment? Anyone like to take that one? No, but I'll try. <laughs> no answer. Um, it has to be both the top down and the bottom up. 
I think really uh, it's the only way. It's the only way to go. Uh, if I may, w one of the challenges is precisely that when we're discussing is that we hear voices from many groups on our campus, but we don't hear many Jewish voices. And 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 it's as if the community sort of, and it's perfectly, it's not a criticism, but you, you stick together and, and, and you suffer in silence. Uh, and, and it would be better if you could appear once in a while on the radar screen. Uh, on the, I would say on the official radar screen, uh, so that we could sort of uh, bluntly face uh, to say, "Hey, we have a we have a Jewish challenge here on campus because we do have Muslim uh, challenge. We do have many challenges, uh, certainly uh, black racism and and certain indigenous issues and certainly, but uh, I must say that and it's a very subjective approach with I look at Noel who was who was in the, in the offshore position of human rights coordinator until recently and 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 honestly we don't hear much about the Jewish community and it reminds me in Quebec when I was heading the human rights commission after the charter of values in Quebec we thought that we would be flooded by complaints coming from the Muslim community at the Human Rights Commission, I, I set up a sort of special task force. You know what? No one came up. No one, strictly no one. And we reached out to the communities and they said, listen, this is so painful for us. We're not reaching out because you're part of the problem. Why would we speak with you? So I'm just hoping that I won't get the same answer from my Jewish community. I, I, I do reach out, please. So very quickly to answer your question, you you said that you were not uh, an optimist, and you know when I mentioned that we're seeing a rise of anti-Semitism and a mainstreamization, I think it shows that I, I I don't I don't live in the land of unicorns and and uh, and arc -en -ciel and rainbows. Um, and at the risk of sounding uh, trite, uh, what choice do we have but to roll up our sleeves and, and, and advocate and, and educate and train and explain and go back to it? Even sometimes it's frustrating, and, and, but we don't have any choice. So let's do it. And that's why I think I'm so grateful for people like professors uh, Kagan and Butler to organize, to have organized this today, because it shows that there's here in, in, in Ottawa, but I believe it will go across the country, a, a dedicated group of people who want to make a difference and let's support them. So Professor Koken and, and I fought for the opportunity to add something here and he won. <laughs> well, you could say, no, no, go ahead. No, no, I, no I, th I think, I think that the, the point that was made earlier by President Fremont about, about it being a collective, this is a collective work. We all have to work together in this way. And I, I think what I've heard from students, for example, who've come to Hillel to, to uh, talk about their experiences of anti-Semitism is that they are really fearful of, of reprisals and repercussions. I think that is what's holding a lot of our students back. And if we can work together to create a climate that is a more positive climate where Jewish identity is recognized, where we see, where, where students uh, see reflected in their professors, reflected in, in, in uh, curricula, uh, reflected in, in in their courses, you know their own identities. I think that 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 will do a, a lot to improve improve matters. And certainly incorporating that as part of our you know EDI initiatives is really really important. So it is it, this is not just uh, you know Jewish students and Jewish faculty and Jewish staff shouldn't be the only ones doing the heavy lifting. It, this is a, this is a campus community job. We all have to work together on this. And now we, we have a number of questions to catch up on. So the gentleman who's right there, and then after him, it's this woman up here, Darlene, please. My name is Michael. I'm in the development, uh, development program at University of Ottawa. I sort of have a two-part question. So the first is to do with student unions. So I think uh, one of the things we've seen is that when we talk about like why we face reprisals as part of the Jewish community, it's because when we go to things like the student union, uh, the responses to stuff like open forums are really, really, uh, I would say nasty. Uh, and we're often told that there isn't much the administration can do. So 
assuming that there's interest in the, in the administration in solving some of those problems, particularly where it comes to the student union, where they're able to pass things like resolutions that outright say things that just aren't true about Israel um, and essentially like demonize uh, our homeland. Uh, the first thing is like, what can students do to aid the administration in attempting to solve those problems? Because given that like we have some of those uh, resolutions and we, we go to these open forums and there might be four Jewish students to every, you know, 40 advocates for the other side, like, we, you know, uh, in a purely democratic process, there isn't much we could do given the amount of misinformation out there. So the question is, what can we do to aid the administration to take essentially matters into their own hands? Uh, the second question, uh, it, it's a little bit less I would say legal, it's uh, perhaps more about like academic freedoms, but uh, I had a rather awful experience in a fourth year class, uh, in development class, where we were supposed to talk about our presentations that we were going to be giving at the end of the semester. And uh, before I went up, there were probably five or six straight, and this is a class of like 30, so not at large sample size, five or six straight presentations that were all about uh, different attacks on Israel. So, you know, how Israel is responsible for the current crisis in Lebanon ever since the initial uh, attacks in Lebanon uh, and, and sort of five or six out of 30 students. Uh, and when I went to the professor's office hours, his, his response was like, I, yeah, I didn't think some of what they were going to say was true, but until I hear specific anti-Semitic tropes, there's not much I can do. So the question, I guess, on academic freedom is like, what can be done about that? Uh, obviously, we can't silence those voices, but what can we do to ensure the professors a little bit better about uh, trying to educate? Thank you. I'm going to ask not to respond for a second. We have three people who are in queue to ask questions, and we're actually over time, and a whole bunch of hands just came up. So what I'd like to do is capture those last three questions that we said we were going to take, take them all together, and then maybe we can get a quick answer, because there are people who have to go to other obligations. So the next one is you please. Um, hi, I'm not sure if I should stand up or not, but um, my name is Sasha. I am a Jewish student at University of Ottawa. I'm in the Faculty of Engineering. Um, and I have personally experienced anti-Semitism, um, even for the, for the limited amount of time that I've been even on campus, but this is my first year on campus. Um, and even uh, outside of campus, uh, when classes were online and uh, online uh, groups related to our, our uh, classes, uh, things like Hitler was a smart man, uh, thing, things like that. And I, I'm a descendant of Holocaust survivors and 30% of my family was murdered in the Holocaust. Um, and things like uh, people telling me that Hamas, an organization that uh, in their charter, uh, wants to uh, murder all Jews in the world. Uh, someone told me that, uh, came up to me and told me that Israel created and funded Hamas and it's their fault. Um, certain things like that. Uh, I was just wondering in terms of that um, online groups and in person, is there is there anything that uh, can be done in terms of that, like just misinformation or uh, anything like that? And as well, I suppose uh, I've also had experiences where um, uh, in faculty of engineering, I'm not sure if it's common in other faculties, but they would have, uh, it's very, very common to have tests on the weekends. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I would say, oh, I cannot have a test on Saturday morning, I'm, I apologize, it's just a religious obligation. They would tell me it's impossible and I have to take the test or else I get a zero. Um, is there anything in that regard in terms of with professors. Yes. So thank you for sharing your experience and um, it's an important question. I'm gonna gather some more questions and it seems very appropriate that Mina Cohn was the next one in line and then it'll be Yael, Darlene, please. And for others, uh, please come to us with your questions and we'll, we'll try to answer some things offline as well. Thank you, Deidre. Uh, thank you for the faculty and everybody that organized this event. It is so important. I don't have a question. I just want to bring to your attention that what is coming to university next is a lot more difficult than what you're dealing with right now. I'm working with the high schools at the Ottawa Carlton District School Board and the Catholic School Board here in Ottawa, and I hear of what's happening across Ontario, and it's very sad and troubling. And the problem is that whatever Dina just said about 
the universities is happening in the high schools. And the response that we get from people at equity and diversity is more troubling because they are the people that are supposed to make sure that Jewish kids are safe in school. Jewish, Jewish students and Jewish staff are afraid to self-identify as Jews today in the high schools. It is so scary for them. And they are only uh, 14 to 17 years old. We're not talking about 20 year olds who know some of the history, who can stand up. These kids are not equipped to stand up against anti-Zionism, which is allowed to happen in the school by principals and administrators. And it's very difficult. We are working um, on education because we believe in education, but the road is very difficult and they're going to come to university soon. So thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, Mina. And Yael is going to get the last official question, but we do want to continue the conversation and hear from those who had questions and comments. Um, thank you. Just a brief comment before my question. Don't be afraid. It's just not a time to be afraid. You know, we already went through the worst as a people. And um, we just got to go for it now and do everything. Um, but um, what I want to ask is a practical question about that clause called national origin. And the question is whether Israelis like me can invoke our national origin against the BDS movement in a more practical and direct way to say, you know, like, like you're saying, my dignity, um, my rights, um, I'm being harassed because this is repeated practice of just picking on me, is there any room for beefing up that national origin? So to pull that all together, we've heard from students who want to know what they can do to help. We've heard from students who want to know what they can do when they're faced with these problems. We've heard a warning of what's to come. And now we've got a very concrete legal question. So. Would anyone like to take any of that? Um, Briefly. <laughs> if, if I may start jump, jump in the pool, as we say. Um, how come on this campus and on campuses across Canada, Black racism issues are so important? And how come Indigenous issues are so important? And they're, they're part of the main agenda, the mainstream agenda. And, and, and I would say it's because the message came out strongly from outside that this is important. And it was sort of bought by the community. It was accepted by the community. And, and, and the, the black racism with the events in the United States, it shocked people. The events in Canada and the, and the various uh, reports, the government report, it shocked people. And that's what we don't have, the sort of engine to, 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 to foster uh, uh, sympathy towards, towards what, what the Jewish group is experiencing in Canada. Uh, victims of discrimination, prime victims of discrimination, but it's as if it's not shocking and in some circles, quite the contrary, people are demanding more. So, so I, I don't have an answer. This being said, on campus, what what I hear this morning, and thank you for you Ottawa students testifying to what they've experienced. This is very important. On campus for black anti-racism, we've had uh, two sessions, if I remember, or at least one. It was hugely painful. People in the room testified, a bit like you have done, you've started to do hugely difficult conversation. I'm not sure it might still be on YouTube, uh, but uh, maybe the beginning of what can be done concretely, and it answers some, some of the questions, 
would be to organize on campus a sort of, uh, I hesitate to use the word, but sort of therapeutic session where, where people testify to what they've experienced. And for me, it was very difficult. I was on, in the front of the room and I had to listen to all this and the teams. And I know there were, there were therapists in the back to support people because it was usually painful uh, for the participants, but it, it really did help the racialized community on campus to move on collectively towards a sort of towards solutions. And for me, it was very important as a university administrator, first to hear, to take dimension of the problem and the issues, and then to be able to, to, to act. And maybe I'm just throwing the idea uh, to myself, uh, maybe tomorrow morning when I sit in my office, I'll say, okay, maybe we should, we should get organized. But, uh, and, and it would, maybe people have ideas of how they could change the people immediately. And I'm sensitive, not everyone is a hero and not everyone should be a hero. Uh, I mean, we deal with these issues as as well as we can or as weakly or as strongly as we can. And, and that is understood. So that might be a, a way forward, certainly for the for the University of Ottawa. Um, and and online online difficulties. Thank Good you. Lord. Thank you. Uh, no comments on that, but it is extremely difficult. Merci, President Fremont. Michael, I saw that you wanted to respond, please. Thank you, thank you, Deidre, and thank you, President Fremont. I think that what's very, very important is that this is not about Jewish students being compromised. It's about Canadian values being compromised. And what's incredibly um, um, sort of being underscored over and over again is it's gonna only have to be a combination of top down and bottom up. And the assurance for, for university students or faculty to be courageous actually has to come from the administration's ability to um, implement that. And I, I, I'm sorry that I'm repeating it. The IHRA, the IRA consensus comprehensive definition of anti-Semitism, we can't escape it because you can't just move from the, what I call traditional anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial, which is bad enough and hope that that'll be enough because what we've actually seen is the appropriation and weaponization of human rights. And that's why some of the students are actually meeting the worst responses in the human rights offices and sometimes in the DEI officers responses because if Zionism is actually being appropriated or described as racism, and only as political discourse instead of as an integral part and identity of most Jews identity and many non-Jews identities, then they actually don't stand a chance. And that's why the comprehensiveness of the IRA working definition has to be both a top down and as I mentioned before, a bottom up protection of protected groups and characteristics including Zionists, those who self-define or maybe perceived as Zionists because of their Jewish external visible signs that they choose to wear. And, and, and I do think that in order for students to be able to lean in and be that courageous self, they do have to have the sense of safety that as we've heard um, um, is sadly um, lacking on, on many of the campuses, including what we've heard here today, which is really devastating actually. Thank you. I, I would add that without a definition of anti-Semitism, how does anyone stand up and know they will be heard when those de what the, the, the very claims that they need to make are not viewed as anti-Semitism? Where are our allies? Where are the people who are standing up with us? It's, it's a very different thing than to stand up as a person of color or someone who's a member of the LGBTQ community where on our campuses, which are progressive spaces, they have allies and there is an agreement about what that prejudice and hatred looks like. Would anyone like to have any kind of final additions to, there was the, the very specific legal question, Professor Dodek. Um, so first, let me address the, uh, I guess there are at least two legal questions, both Sasha and uh, some of the things that Sasha was talking about, as well as uh, uh, Yael's suggestions. Uh, 
any good lawyer would say to be hesitant to give legal advice. Uh, that that being said, I think I I'm on pretty solid ground, and some of the experts behind Sasha may support me that uh, a request for accommodation in a course relating to religious grounds is one of the core areas of accommodation. And that's something that should be um, uh, that should be standard. And that's something where, you know, if there is a problem, the human rights office is well equipped uh, to deal with that pretty quickly. For uh, and, and to and to just elaborate on some of Sasha and other students' concerns, we need on campus and in the community, we need offices, groups, people to support and counsel and advocate on behalf of students. We have some offices, they, they are good at some things, they need to be improved in other things like any offices. Um, and we need to strengthen those resources. Uh, in terms of Yael's yeah, question, the very direct legal question, uh, I don't, it's not something that I think can be answered uh, directly and concretely uh, the way that Sasha's question could be. I think we should be exploring multiple legal avenues. As other people have said, I don't think that the law is the answer uh, to anti-Semitism, to the experience of students, uh, but per the law can perhaps provide different avenues of redress in certain instances. So I think it's it's worth pursuing and thinking about. Thank you so much. Sure. I, I just want to thank everyone for being here today on a Sunday morning. Um, this has been a, a tremendous, uh, a tremendous panel and an amazing, um, really to take us through framework. Uh, experiences, the IRA definition, understanding what the experiences of our students and our faculty are. I think I'm, I'm just so, so pleased with the way this worked out. And I want to thank Miriam Elman, Jacques Cremont, Adam Dodek, Richard Marceau for being here, uh, for, for their contributions. I want to thank you again for, for attending. Michal. And Michal, Michal, <laughs> I, you're here, yes. And, and of course, Michal kotler Wunsch, who's, who's with us uh, coming from Israel. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we this is this is the beginning of a conversation, and I think um, I'm I'm really pleased with where where we've begun and and where we're going. So so thank you so much for being here. Good job. Thank you so much. It is an inspiration to have a leader at Montreal University. Oh, amazing. Thank you very much.